today we are going to talk about aquatic therapy and its role in rehabilitation for cerebral palsy uh, you you already uh, already have heard dr khushbu who spoke about neuro rehabilitation in cerebral palsy today we are going to extend that and talk about one of the regimes in neuro rehabilitation which is aquatic therapy now i would like to take uh, i would like all of you to take out uh, a minute and look at all of these children while i'm introducing myself to you i'm dr amrita paranspe i am the chief scientific officer and head of aquatic therapy department in neurogen brain and spine institute and it is my great pleasure today to talk to you about a topic very close to my heart which is aquatic therapy so if you look at all of these children and their faces they all very happy and they are all playing in water and i'm sure all of you have experienced the same when you do any activity in water may it be just a simple uh, taking a shower you know we come back from the end of the day very tiring day hectic day we have had fight we have had uh, some disappointing things happening in our life and what we want to do for the first the first thing that we want to do once we go home is take a shower and it really helps us relax and it really helps us take out a lot of stress out of our mind and water has that effect on us it is very profound uh, that effect that it has uh in uh, our mythology uh, in hindu mythology there are five elements which are the uh, core elements of this whole universe and water is one of them also when we are born we are born uh, in the womb where you know we are surrounded with water the 80% of our body is formed with water so water has a very profound effect on our being and that is what we want to exploit and that is what we want to harness into the therapeutic benefit so aquatic therapy is known by various names so i'm sure you uh, if there are parents watching they might have come across uh, hydrotherapy a lot that was a name that was there uh, used a couple of uh, years ago uh, there's also hydrology hydratics hydrogymnastic aquatic exercises water aerobics water exercises so aquatic therapy is known by all of these different names Uh, essentially the principles remain the same and the kind of exercises that a child is made to do uh, remains the same uh, some of the techniques may vary i will be talking about those techniques to you as well and how water benefits these children or why we need to do aquatic therapy for these children when we are already doing so much on land so many exercises on land how aquatic therapy is going to be different from that so i'm going to first uh, enlist a certain points as to why aquatic therapy uh, can be beneficial in these children and then as we complete uh, this ppt i will be talking about these points again and you would understand in much uh, greater depth the meaning behind what i have written so why we need aquatic therapy in cerebral palsy is a to defeat gravity many of the children of cerebral palsy are not able to walk or they have deformities or they have uh, abnormal posturing or compensatory movements it is because they are not able to defeat the effect of gravity the muscles are not strong enough to work against the gravity second is to facilitate movement obviously because of these abnormal postures or compensatory movements their movements are restricted or limited or not in the proper pattern so aquatic therapy is used to facilitate movements to promote motor learning which means to promote learning of movement patterns and then to register these movement patterns as a um, as a map in our brain so that the brain can do it more efficiently the next time strengthening of the muscles of course uh, prevent fibrotic processes fibrosis is the process where uh, of scarring uh, to put it in simple terms so if a body part is injured when it is healing the scar is formed which is not which does not have the same quality as the tissue it uh, it is replacing so if the muscles are damaged and there is scar formation the extensibility of the muscles is affected the strength of the muscles is affected if the skin is damaged and there is scar tissue formation you know there is pigmentation the color of that particular part is slightly different also the extensibility the uh, you know when we touch the scar we don't have the sensation as good as on the other part of the skin so the scar tissue has uh, very uh, different properties from its actual tissues and therefore this fibrotic processes in muscles ligaments and joints and parts of the body can be very detrimental to movement 
so we do exercises in, in water to prevent these fibrotic processes also to reduce the inflammation which is uh, the internal swelling you can say that uh, the tissues uh, have uh, to reduce the joint dysfunction when the muscles are not working properly the joints are in abnormal postures and abnormal uh, positions and therefore there is a lot of dysfunction of the joint capsulars uh, uh, structures the soft tissue structures around it also the articular structures that is the bones of the joints as well Redu uh, to improve the cardiovascular endurance now one thing that these children uh, lack is movement they are not able to walk they are not able to turn in bed they're not able to crawl so the body lacks movement and our heart thrives on movement so if we don't do movements our heart is going to be less and less efficient uh, it has to be used more and more and it has to be pushed more and more to become more stronger and to gain that endurance so cardiovascular endurance is something that uh, usually is very poor in these con in, in these children because of their inability to move but in water, we can do a lot of uh, exercises for them, which can help in increasing their cardiovascular endurance as well. Uh, improve their respiratory strength and endurance. Now, when the children are immobile, also their breathing ability is affected because of the abnormal posturing. Uh, sometimes their ribcage uh, movement is not proper because they are slouched or their hands are uh, not moving. So their hands are compressing on their chest. Because of this, the chest doesn't expand very well and they are not able to breathe very well. So this we can, for this also, we can take them in water and can help them a lot. Now, what are the properties of water? Now, we know that, okay, these are the potential benefits uh, to children with cerebral palsy in water. But what makes water so special? What are these qualities of water that make it so special? So the first is it is colorless. Of course, you can observe everything that is going on in the uh, in the water without any trouble. Uh, it is odorless. There's no smell. It is a good solvent. It is a good conductor of heat. And the last part we have to be a little bit cautious of, which is good conductor of electricity. So we have to make sure that the therapy and the exercises are being done in an environment where there is no chance of, um, you know, any electric uh, contamination. It also takes the shape of the container. It is uncompressible. Uh, it has a very strong adhesion and cohesion. That means that the two water molecules bind to each other very well. The buoyancy, uh, the density of the water, the specific gravity, viscosity, hydrostatic pressure, moment of force and refraction. Now, these are the qualities that make water very special. It may sound like I'm going to go into the physics of, uh, you know, go back to your 12th standard and teach you the physics of water properties. But no, I'm just going to briefly introduce these concepts because it is important for you to know what are these concepts to really understand how aquatic therapy can benefit children with cerebral palsy so the first thing is density density is mass per unit volume so water has the unit density or one uh, density of one so we usually compare all the other densities to the density of water and that is also called as relative density of different uh, object uh, different uh, substances now, density of air is 0 0.0013. So that's, it is very thin or very, um, uh, what do you say, it is very uh, sparse. So whenever you do movements in that, you don't feel anything. If I move my hand in the air like this, if I just wave my hand in the air, I don't feel anything. But if I do the same in water, there is a lot of force or there is a lot of effort that I have to put in performing that movement. Because as you can see, water is almost 800 times thicker or denser as compared to the air. Now, buoyancy. What is buoyancy? Buoyancy is the force uh, that water exerts in all the objects that are immersed in it in the upward direction. So if you put anything in water, water pushes it up on the surface. This is the force that counteracts gravity. So it is uh, against uh, in the opposite direction of that of gravity. Uh, gravity is the force that pulls us all down and keeps us grounded. So when we go in water, there is an opposite effect of gravity and buoyancy. And because of that, there is a weightlessness that we experience. So we all feel that we are very, we feel light when we go in water. And that is because of the buoyancy. 
so every body has a center of buoyancy and a center of gravity which are the two points where this force is acting uh, primarily or this is force is concentrated so for uh, when we for the calculations or the physical calculations we can use these points um, in the body now these two points are slightly different so it's not that the uh, center of gravity and center of buoyancy are exactly at the same point in the body and because of which there is a torsional force so if to give you an example if this is the center of gravity and this is the center of buoyancy so on this point the gravity is pulling me down whereas on this point the buoyancy is pushing me up so you can see there is a rotational movement so if the buoyancy is pushing me up and the gravity is pulling me down there is going to be a rotational movement in the body now this is what happens in water with all of us so we either rotate like this or we can rotate like this or we can rotate like this so there are these three axes in the body uh, around which the body can rotate and the rotation movement is caused because of these differences in the buoyancy and the gravity now what is viscosity viscosity is how thick water is or how uh you know sticky water as you can say in, in in lay terms really but it is the internal friction which is causing this thickness or this stickiness of the substance now in water the viscosity is not very um, very uh, much whereas if you compare something like honey then the viscosity is much more so it's very thick it's very sticky doesn't move uh, very easily so if you were to move imagine yourself in the big pool of honey if you were to walk it will almost be impossible because the viscosity is so much but in water that's not a, a problem it has the viscosity but it's not uh, it, it doesn't stop you from moving it gives you a little bit of resistance but it doesn't limit your movements cohesion and adhesion these are the two properties which uh, basically say how water molecules bind with each other and this is also important for uh, the resistance that water provides while um, while an object is trying to move inside so as i said when i wave my hand in the air i don't feel anything but when i wave my hand in water i feel a lot and that is because of these forces like cohesion and adhesive forces in between the water molecules and the viscosity of water uh, hydrostatic pressure now we all must have experienced this that as soon as we get inside the water the first thing that we do once we are in the neck deep water is now why is that why do we all gasp for breath when we go in the water that is because of this hydrostatic pressure because water is compressing on on our chest from all the direction it's like somebody is you know it's somebody is not letting you breathe and so the first thing that we do is and also of course water is cold most of the times when we get in if it's a hot water pool uh, it will not be that severe reaction but yeah so the hydrostatic pressure puts a lot of difficulty of breathing for you and this is what we are going to use to train the respiratory muscles because it's easier to breathe in the air but it's more difficult to breathe when you're immersed inside water now compressibility what is compressibility now you all know the cooking gas that we use at home okay it is a, um, it is it is a gas it when it is in gas form you can compress it compress it and then it turns into the liquid form and then it can be compressed even further but water you can't do that you can't compress water to form ice right so it it has no compressibility at all and this is a very good quality because this again helps us by getting a resistance to movement this is the quality that gives resistance to all the movement because when you're trying to move an object water cannot be compressed water cannot uh, the volume of water cannot be made any smaller so there is a lot of resistance to it so now if we can't make the volume smaller then what happens uh, i'm sure you all must have heard of uh, eureka or the archimedes principle that whenever we insert a certain amount of volume in water the same amount is therefore displaced because water is not compressible now the next quality the physical property of water is refraction refraction is uh, i'm sure we all must have experienced at some point of time if you can see in this glass the straw is not really crooked but it looks like it is crooked when you put it in the glass of water and this is because of refraction so when the rays of light enter the water they don't pa they don't continue their uh, movement in the same uh, line it is slightly that line is slightly distorted 
and therefore uh, the objects that we see in the water are slightly uh, uh, crooked or twisted or you feel like they're disjointed it's because of refraction it's very important to know this factor because when you're observing people uh, from outside the pool then at that time you need to know about all of this now what are the hydrodynamic principles as i said the first so hydrodynamic principles means the principles or the gu that guide the movement inside water either movement of the fluid or movement of an object inside the fluid the first thing is archimedes principle uh, which as i said uh, when you put uh, anything in water the same amount is displaced and uh, it's it's basically the weightlessness that we feel is explained by archimedes principle the bouguer principle again tells us about uh, the rotational component that i already explained how center of gravity and buoyancy has an effect in bringing about this rotational movement in any of the in any uh, body that is either uh, floating on the surface of the water or immersed in the water now bernoulli's theorem for this we need to understand uh, what are eddy currents and what is the laminar flow and the turbulent flow so eddy currents are basically the small the small currents that are formed um, when an, any object moves in water okay now these are formed more when the flow is turbulent or and laminar flow doesn't give rise to less eddy currents so what does that mean what is a laminar flow what is a turbulent flow why should you know about it as a parent so uh, laminar flow is basically uh, when water is flowing in one direction like in the swimming pool when nobody is when nobody is inside the swimming pool the water is still and all the movement of water is only in one direction but as soon as there are a lot of people in the swimming pool what happens there are movements from every side people are splashing water somebody is swimming some children are playing and there are different motions that are going on in the water and that's where you have this turbulent flow because there are different water currents already being formed why do you need to know about this to perform any movement in this laminar flow is much easier because water is going only in one direction and the resistance that you experience is also in a particular way whereas in this turbulent flow the direction of water flow is you can't predict where the water is going from and so the resistance that you experience for any movement is also more so you need to understand that when you take your children in water we have to take into consideration all of these factors now coming back to eddy currents these small currents that are formed when an object passes in the water uh, these are the currents that uh, res resist or restrict or pull uh, the object back so they they work in the opposite direction of the op of the movement and these currents are formed more in the turbulent flow in this environment so in the pool where everybody is playing there will be more eddy currents formed and there will be more resistance to the movement now uh, what objects uh, how the shape of the object matters in the water so if you see a round ball moving in the water it creates so many eddy currents if you see a, a square block which is moving in the water there are so many eddy currents but if you see something in the shape of a drop or something in the shape of a fish or a bird then that does not create a lot of eddy currents so this is the most efficient uh, shape to move in water and that's why obviously the fish body is is shaped in this uh, in this fashion now we've heard of hydrostatic pressure there is a principle that guides how hydrostatic pressure also behaves in water and that's called pascal's law which states that no matter uh, how how much is the depth of immersion the hydrostatic pressure that is experienced all over the body it will be same so you experience a similar equal lateral pressure from all over the body uh finally the relative density which i have already spoken to you about because density of water is one we compare the density of all the other substances to this density and then we calculate how does that help us so basically if anything has a density of more than 1 then those are the substances that are going to drown in water or that are going to sink in water and if anything has density of less than 1 then those are the substances that are going to float on water why is it important because our body is made of different tissues and they have different densities so we have to uh, know what are the densities of these uh, substances or these tissues and how this can change 
so we have bones we have muscles we have fat tissue we have connective tissue now when any of the uh, bone muscle or fat is damaged it is going to be replaced by these connective tissues by the scar tissue so it is very important to know the body which has a lot of scar tissue and the body which does not have scar tissues there will be a lot of difference in the density so if we see here the according to their relative densities the fat and the connective tissue they they are they can float on water so fat definitely floats and the connective tissue is little bit on the edge so the density is very close to that of the water whereas bones and muscles they sink they definitely sink their density is much higher as compared to the density of water now we have already heard or listen about uh, how, what are the properties of water that are beneficial but how does that matter to us or how does that affect us as human beings what effect does water have on our body so i'm going to tell you what is the effect of immersion in water so if you are put inside a swimming pool at different levels of immersion say waist deep chest deep neck deep then what is going to happen to your heart what is going to happen to your brain what is going to happen to your joints and muscles all of that i'm going to explain to you now these are called physiological effects or the effects that uh, are experienced by our bodies and body and tissue first one is cardiovascular system so as i said in the introduction when i explained to you what are the potential benefits of aquatic therapy in cerebral palsy cardiovascular system is probably the most uh, the system that we can influence the most in water as compared to land because on land there is a lot of limitation on the movements that can be performed uh, also on land sometimes the movements elicit pain and that can affect uh, the you know performance or long term performance of that movement and therefore cardiovascular systems are not are rarely challenged in these children so as you you know as the children grow their activity level increases day by day first they're not able to uh, sit up also then they sit then they start crawling they start walking running and their energy level uh, is very high children are just running all over all day and this helps in strengthening their heart as well because these movements um, uh, push the heart uh, beyond its boundaries or beyond, it increases the endurance of the heart the heart has to function more efficiently to pump enough blood to give to all the tissues that are being used when they are doing some movements but in these children because the activities are limited the heart is never uh, pushed beyond its boundary we are not training the heart enough and so uh, it can get weaker and weaker because it's not being used as much as it should be so uh, i'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail into uh, you know the technical details of how water immersion helps and i'm going to simply uh, explain to you this so when we immerse a person in a chest level or a neck deep level water immersion you know there is hydrostatic pressure so hydrostatic pressure acts like pump so it compresses on the muscles uh, of your legs of your thighs of your hands and the all the blood that is there in these uh, organs is pushed up or is pushed up back into your heart now when uh, there is only a limited amount of blood in our body when the heart receives more blood it is able to push out more blood as well so it is very important that the blood that heart pushes out comes back to it as well uh, and the maximum uh, return of blood will give us better benefit and the same thing happens because this hydrostatic pressure helps to push the blood up back to the heart so because of that the amount of blood that heart can pump in a second or in a heartbeat it increases it automatically increases the blood volume uh, of heart uh it can also increase in one stroke so in one heartbeat how much blood is being pumped out uh it also reduces the heart rate now this is very important because what happens is uh, say a heart beats 100 ml in each beat so we have only 5000 uh, sorry 500 5000 ml of blood being pumped out now if in one stroke the heart is able to give out 100 ml then obviously the amount of strokes required will be much lesser so the heart doesn't have to pump very often because the amount of blood it's supplying in one stroke itself is much more 
this is very important for heart that means we are not tiring our heart out a lot it's important to keep the heart rate low it can't be very high because it is not it's not very efficient if it's very high so reduction in the heart rate is something that is very good and that automatically happens when you go in the water so when you're immersed in the water after a couple of minutes you see that your heart rate will drop as compared to on land without doing anything so what is the effect on the respiratory system so again i'm not going to go into explaining the whole uh, technical details of it but to tell you uh, uh, in again simple terms when we go in water again it's neck level uh, immersion or uh, chest level immersion there is a compressive force again because of the hydrostatic pressure and the viscosity and cohesive adhesive forces of water there is a compressive force on the chest wall and to expand also the muscles have to work a lot because there is a resistance uh, to that movement now that uh, can be used as a respiratory uh, training uh, modality or to train the respiratory muscles to strengthen the respiratory muscles one drawback of that is those who have weak muscles or those who are not able to breathe uh, sufficiently so on land also if they have very shallow breathing and they use only the accessory muscles of the neck like that or they are breathless uh, when they talk they get breathless when they do a certain movement they get breathless such patients or such children if we take in water we have to be very cautious because there they are going to get even more breathless and we can trigger uh, maybe some kind of a respiratory Uh, failure in them if we are not being cautious so it is very important that when you take children in water you are with somebody who understands what are the effects of water immersion and uh, they they are well trained to handle if if there is any effect on the child so uh, when there is resistance for uh, this kind of a movement uh, it eventually increases the work of breathing by 60% so it is 60% more difficult to breathe inside the water as compared to on land which is very important for us to keep in mind when we take our children uh, in the pool now we all know if we can't breathe we can't perform any activity if you hold your breath and uh, if you are asked to jump up and down 10 times you will not be able to do that you may feel very tired after that because oxygen is very important for providing energy to our muscles as well if the work of breathing is increased by 60% and if the children are not able to breathe properly or uh, they're not able to take in enough air then they will not be able to perform enough movements also then why do we want to take them in water at all if it's going to harm if, you know if it's going to be harmful for them so it's not like that although the work of breathing increases it's only at the level of neck level immersion when we take children in water we can choose their immersion level and the activity level depending upon or taking into consideration all of these factors so even though the work of breathing increases we can gradually increase this uh, uh, gradually expose them to this increased effort and strengthen their muscles while we are doing it so that on land they can be much more beneficial so it is immensely important that a person who understands Uh, all of these effects and how to manage them should take the children in water now uh, what is the effect on renal and endocrine system now the endocrine system means the system that uh, secretes all the hormones in the body uh, renal system is of course our kidneys and how we filter our blood uh, if you see that the creatine clearance uh, is much higher when we uh, you know immerse um, somebody in water it plateaus and then slowly starts declining uh, whereas potassium and sodium uh, excretion if you see it goes on increase so sodium is more steep than potassium it goes on increasing and then slowly beyond 3 4 hours of continuous immersion it reduces what is the what is the meaning of all of this what is creatine potassium and sodium why do we want to know about that what it basically means is that when we put somebody in water their urine output is also going to increase because of all of these factors so what it means is we feel like peeing more often when we go to the pool so the same thing will happen to the children that they would want to go to the toilet more often when they are swimming or they are doing aquatic therapy now it's very important to know this because uh, children who are not able to indicate very well when they want to go to the toilet 
uh, we have to keep this in uh, mind. We do, it's better not to put them in water for more than 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, keep it less than an hour for sure, because after an hour, then you see that the urine output increases. Uh, if you see in the previous slide, after an hour, you can see there is a steep increase and then there is more steep increase between one to two hours. So it is important that uh, we keep this session below one hour duration. Now, what is the effect on different uh, hormones? I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but these are some of the hormones that are important uh, for cerebral palsy. And so I'm going to talk about that. You can see here uh, in the red, there is a hormone called dopamine. Now, this is a hormone that is very important for smooth movements, especially in children who have dystonia. Uh, it can happen because of some dysfunction in part of a brain called basal ganglia, which uh, again, is important in, in formation of this particular hormone and this hormone if we don't if there is a severe uh, deficiency of this hormone in our body then uh, we can see uh, parkinson like syndrome so the disease parkinson's disease also happens because of lack of uh, this hormone so you can see when you are in water the production of this hormone already increases so it is going to help the movements uh, of these children who have dystonia naturally just by putting them in water because this hormone is more available in the water now uh, the epinephrine and norepinephrine these are the happy hormones or they also um, uh, help to control the pain and they elevate the mood so these two hormones are also important in, in these children but dopamine is something uh, that we really need to focus on then the musculoskeletal systems, how does the putting them in water help in um, uh, help for their muscles and joints? So there's something called as a ground uh, ground reaction force. So what it means, I'm sure you all must have heard of uh, the, uh, Newton's law that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if I hit ground with my feet, the ground is also going to exert a force back on my body. So when I walk, when I walk on the ground with every step, there is a force that I experience uh, that is coming in the opposite direction from the ground towards the body. That is called ground reaction force. It's very important to understand about this force because we, our joints have to constantly combat this force. And so if you notice running on a hard concrete surface and running on grass, you feel much better running on the grass because the ground reaction force is much lesser. So your joints are not uh, affected that much. Now in water, this is the ground reaction force on land. So when you run on land, this is what happens. So if you're walking, if, if the more force you put on land in uh, say ju running, jumping, the ground reaction force goes on increasing. Whereas the same activities, if you do in water, you can see this yellow line, the ground reaction forces are much lesser. So which means that what you experience, the reaction that you experience um, back in your joints is much lesser in water. So that is very good for the for preventing the integrity of your joints. Now, Why does that happen? Why do you feel less ground reaction force in water? The reason is the, uh, the difference between the uh, gravity and buoyancy. The gravity and buoyancy cancel out each other and there is weightlessness. And this weightlessness results in reduction of the ground reaction force also. So how much weightlessness uh, or how much weight can you perceive uh, when you are immersed in water? So if, if you imagine a person whose weight is 100 kgs, then when he is immersed up to shin level, his weight becomes only 85 kg. So only 85% of the weight can be experienced by the ankle joint at this point of time. When you immerse him in the knee deep water, the ankle joints can only feel the weight of 65 kg. When you put them in the waist uh, level immersion, then the knees and ankle joints can only feel the weight of 50 kg, which is only half of that of the actual weight. When he's uh, immersed till, say, uh, till the chest level, then the weight is only 25 to 30 kg. So the hips, knees and joints can only feel 25 to 30 kg as compared to the 100 kg. And when he's immersed uh, in neck deep water, at that time, it's only 10 kg. So there is a 10 times reduction in the weight uh, of, of a person. So, or 90% reduction in the weight of the person. So 
this is very important for preventing the joint integrity when we are on the when we are on land the gravity is continuously pulling us down what happens to our knees because of that the knees the bones are just grinding on each other but when you are in water they get they get separated and so the movements can be much better they can be much painless also when the joint surface is touch or when there is deformity it's painful to put weight on that joint and walk or uh, to perform any particular movement but when we are in water that that movement may not be as painful and so we can do it much more uh, efficiently we can do it man many more times we can repeat it children will not be very unhappy doing it so they'll be more cooperative with the exercises because that's something also very important children are not very cooperative for exercises i'm sure every child and every parent must have uh, experiences that as soon as you walk into the physiotherapy room the child starts crying because they don't want to exercise but believe me when we have children in our pool uh, the moment they see the pool they are happy they want to come inside and they want to play they want to experience water so those are the uh, some of the other advantages the psychological advantages also of doing aquatic therapy now what is about what about the nervous uh, system which is the most important in cerebral palsy because we know that nervous system is affected uh, which leads to all of these secondary uh, uh, affection of uh, musculoskeletal systems and everything but nerve system is something that we that is a focus of the pathology now skin sense and nerve endings are affected um, by water so what does that mean when we put as i said before I've, i've said it a lot of times in this talk today that when i move my hand in air i don't feel anything but when i put my hand in water the from the time i put my hand in water i am aware of water and its presence because of the sensory stimuli that i get so it's it's the touch it's the the hydrostatic pressure that gives me proprioception or my joints are uh, being compressed so my joints also are feeling something my skin is also feeling something and when i move my hand the sensory stimulation is much more now unless we have the sensory stimuli we can't perform a movement we only perform a movement as uh, so when we are learning movements we perform movements in response to any sensory stimuli so we either perform in response to uh, a sound so we turn towards to look at that sound or we see something and we want to go more close and and see that better so we perform a movement i see some shiny object and i want to catch it so i move my hand and try to hold it so all the movements are elicited because of the sensory inputs that i get i want to move my body away because something is pricking me or i'm feeling pain in my joint so i want to adjust myself i want to move my body so the movement uh, gen is generated from the sensory stimuli and these needs to respond to the sensory stimuli so if we increase the sensory stimuli it is also going to facilitate movement generation in these children with cerebral palsy because their movements are already limited we have to increase the sensory stimulation as well so they can do or perform or respond to those sensations better now it also has a relaxation effect on the body as i said before there are certain hormones that are secreted uh, which which can cause this as well and also the sensory stimulation that we get you know when uh, if if you get hurt uh, if i bump my head on on the wall the first thing my mother would do is keep her hand on the head or you know rub my forehead why do we do that to increase the stimulation it reduces the pain uh, stimuli as well and it gives a soothing effect now the same thing can happen in happens in water as well uh, it also has an effect on uh, on a system that um, that makes us fall asleep uh, and because of that also we get a relaxation effect when we go in water uh, it also suppresses the sympathetic activity so there are two uh, different systems in our body called sympathetic and parasympathetic which either uh, increase the stress levels and alertness of the body or relax the body by reducing those uh, those things so one system increases the heart rate increases the blood pressure the other system reduces the heart rate reduces the blood pressure and so on one system contracts the blood vessels the other one dilates the blood vessels so uh, the system that uh, increases the stress is the sympathetic system so in water when you go there is suppression of the sympathetic activity and because of that also there is a 
relaxation effect that we experience and it's not just psychological but it's physical also your body also experiences a relaxation effect so it obviously helps in reducing uh, some of the psychological uh, symptoms also like anxiety fear depression so water has a very profound effect on these symptoms as well so there are multiple uh, therapeutic benefits of water which we all have discussed just now uh, it it helps in reducing the anxiety it helps in reducing uh, depression so what are the limitations uh, that children with cerebral palsy experience on land now after knowing what are the benefits of water immersion what are uh, the properties of water it's time to relook at uh, what we discussed first and what are the benefits of being immersed in water and being perform and performing certain movements in water for children with cerebral palsy so on land we all know that the movements are constantly hindered by gravity they're not able to sit uh, erect they're not able to stand erect because they're not able to combat the gravity the muscles are not as strong there is also risk of falls if the child is not able to walk properly uh, they may fall uh, on land while walking or while trying to get up and that can that can sometimes be harmful they can get fractures they can get hurt they can get bruised uh, whereas in in water, if you see, if, even if they fall, nothing is going to happen. Maximum, what will happen? Some nose, some water will go in their nose and mouth, and they'll cough. But before, but nothing very serious or damaging can happen. So we can reduce this risk of falls in water. There are increased joint compressive forces while they do the challenging movement. So as I said, when they are standing and they want to reach out, they are standing and they want to uh, perform a particular movement with lifting their arms up. And the, the compressive forces on their ankles, their uh, knees are much more uh, because of the gravity and because of wanting to perform this movement. This happens uh, especially more in uh, children who have spasticity and who have dystonia. Because uh, in, in dystonia and also uh, to some extent in ataxic uh, children, because to perform a movement, they need to seek, you know, they need to stabilize their joints. Now, in spasticity, what happens is the muscles are already in the state of uh, heightened contraction, or they are rigid, the muscles. And because of that, the joints are always uh, being compressed on each other because the muscles are always contracted. In dystonia and ataxia, what happens is the movements are uh, 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 can't be controlled very well. They are not able to control the movements very well. And so when they want to perform a particular movement, their proximal muscles or the proximal joints have to give them the stability. And because the muscles are not functioning properly, the only way they can get the stability is by uh, locking the joints or putting the joints in the abnormal position so that it gives them uh, some stability and then perform the movements. So because of this, there is uh, increased joint compression. So there is restriction of performing the movements also. If you see a lot of children with uh, cerebral palsy, they have slouch, so they sit like this. Now, when if I'm sitting like this and I have to lift my hand up, it's very difficult. I can't lift it beyond this point. Unless I sit straight, I can't lift up my hand. Now, this is a postural uh, uh, you know, deviation from what we see in the typically developing children. And that leads to restriction in performing movements as well. Uh, because there is no, not enough movement, the muscles are not acting very well. So the, uh, the muscles that are basically a uh, pump, uh, you know, the peripheral pump of the body is called calf muscle, which, which pushes all the blood back to the heart. Now, if uh, there is pooling of the blood, if the muscles are not working very well, then the blood stagnates. So the blood flow is very stagnant in the extremities, that is in their feet, in their hands. And... As I, if you recall what I had mentioned before, if the blood uh, is in the extremities, for if, if it doesn't come back to the heart, then the heart will not have enough blood to pump out, and so it will have to work harder. So it puts a negative effect on the heart as well because of this pooling of the blood. And uh, sometimes uh, the movements can also cause harm uh, to certain uh, muscles. Now, uh, the movements, when you put people, uh, these children in water, their movements are automatically facilitated by buoyancy. The risk of fall reduces. The joint compression reduces because of weight, uh, because of the weightlessness. They can perform movements much better. The blood is pumped back to the heart. There is better blood supply to the brain also because when the blood is pumped up, the 
you know, more blood is going to go to the brain as well. Uh, there is some uh, suppression of the uh, the sympathetic system, which reduces the stress. Now, uh, what the first slide that we uh, discuss, what is the need for aquatic therapy in cerebral palsy? We're going to talk about that. All those points again, it's going to make much more sense to you that, of course, to defeat gravity, as I said, because of the buoyancy, the effect of gravity is much lesser. Uh, we've already discussed enough about how it uh, facilitates movements. How does it promote motor learning? Now, motor learning is something very important, uh, something that uh, all the parents also need uh, to understand the concept of motor learning. When a child is performing a movement, if you if you observe children as they grow up and they are learning the movements, the movements are very crude. So first time they want to you know, take their hand on their face. They're not able to do that. If you see, if you hold a child and they want to caress your face, uh, instead of doing this, you get a slap on your face because they are not able to control the movements and they just tap on your face. So, but then slowly they understand how to control their hand, how to perform that movement. And that is called as motor learning. Now, motor learning is a process of sensory stimuli and response of the muscles and the motor response of the muscles and the joints. So we constantly learn how to perform the movements better and better. And it is because we are getting the responses or the sensory stimuli for that. So if I'm walking and I'm having pain, then automatically I walk in a different pattern. Does anybody teach me how to walk in a different pattern uh, because I have pain to avoid pain? No, the body learns it on its own. We start lurching, we start, uh, you know, going, putting more weight on one side where uh, it's not hurting. Or if my elbow is uh, injured, if my arm is injured, then I will keep my elbow stiff and do the movements. Nobody teaches me that. The body learns that on its own. That's called as motor learning. Now, if I'm able to, the more the movements I can perform, the more I can, um, the sensory stimuli I can get and the better I can learn. If I'm not able to explore, if I'm not able to perform different movements, then I will never be able to learn those movements. Because you can't be taught a movement by just saying it. You have to experience it also. So in water, when we facilitate movements, when they're able to do movements that they are never able to do on land, I'm going to show you some videos to, to explain what that means. Uh, then you're promoting motor learning. Then the body is exploring how it can perform a certain movement in a more efficient way. And then water is just an environment that we are giving them so that they can explore and perform these movements. Of course, we are not fishes. We are human beings and we are going to come on land. And eventually they should be able to perform that movement on land. But once they learn the motor pattern, then the brain uh, can perform that movement in other environments and then also perform the movement in a way that, okay, on, on land, this particular adaptation needs to be made for this movement. So the brain is in the position to learn it better. So that's why we have to first give them an opportunity to explore a movement in water. And slowly on land, they can pick up the movements as well. Uh, it, of course, helps in strengthening of the muscles because the water provides so much of resistance for any movement. Now, you know how children hate exercises. You can't tie a weight on their uh, arm and ask them to you know, lift the arm up and down 10 times. You can for a few days, but then eventually they're going to get bored. They're not going to want to come for exercises. They're going to cry. All of that happens. But in water, when I just, I don't have to do anything. I just tell them to splash water on somebody. And it's enjoyable. They enjoy it. They want to do it again and again. And in the meantime, I'm also strengthening their arms. So uh, we can combine the activities uh, with fun uh, play activities as well. And it's much more enjoyable for uh, children. Their adherence is much better. Uh, it also prevents fibrotic processes. Now, children who have severe spasticity, if you see, their joints can go in uh, awkward positions and then they can develop something called as contractures, where their muscles uh, are in the shortened position, the joints are in the, um, in, in the bent uh, position. Why does that happen? That happens because there is a lot of fibrosis in these muscles. And uh, as I said, the scar tissue or the fibrous tissue has very different uh, qualities as compared to the muscles. So they are not as stretchy or that extensible as compared to the muscles. And so they become shortened. Now, uh, when they are shortened, the, of course, the muscles can't perform their function also very well. So the movement is affected and it's a vicious circle. So it, 
it goes on increasing once there is a deformity. Now in water, when we go, um, because there is better blood supply to all of the different tissues, there is better, uh, uh, the movements are facilitated, more type of movements can be performed. We can prevent these fibrotic processes. We can prevent uh, the scarring from, uh, or from the muscles and the connective tissue. Uh, it also reduces inflammation. So water, as, as I uh, discussed in the, what effects does water have on the body? Because of the increased blood supply, because of the better ventilation, uh, because of all of those effects, the different hormones that are secreted, the, the clearance, the urine output is increased, so the blood is being filtered uh, often and more effectively as well. Because of all of that, the inflammation or the swelling that the tissues have also reduces. Uh, automatically, the joint dysfunction is less because the weight of the body is less and the muscles are working better. Uh, the muscles are being strengthened. There are no fibrotic, pro there are lesser fibrotic processes. So the joint dysfunction also reduces. And because the movement has increased, the heart and the respiratory systems also get better and better. So here's a child uh, who um, is not able to perform a movement. He has dystonia. So he is not able to catch the ring when he's out of the water. Now you will see in the water when he's performing the movement, the movement is very smooth. In the same amount of time, he has shifted the ring at least two to three times. Now this is what I meant by being able to explore the movement. Now when you do motor learning, uh, for motor learning to take place, a movement has to be repeated at least a thousands of thousands of times. So you know when children are growing up, they take a year to be able to take the first step or to be able to learn how to walk. And they have not still mastered uh, the act of walking at age of one year. They've just merely learned how to do it without falling. So, but before they even stand up and start walking, they, they fall down so many times and they keep practicing again and again and again. And one day they realize how to perform that movement. They're able to manage their balance and then slowly they learn. So the motor learning requires a lot of time and a lot of repetitions. Now I'm going to show you this video again. If you see here, uh, when in, in when you're making him do exercises in an hour, if he's going to perform a movement like this, I can only get him to do this maybe 15 times, 20 times, say 50 times. But if he's performing movements so smoothly, then I can make him do 100 times, 200 times as well. So the amount of repetitions that I can give can be much better. Also, the dystonia is less here. So you can see the shakiness of the hand is less inside the water. So the brain also is learning a better movement pattern. The brain is not getting confused with all the involuntary movements that are happening. Now, if you can see here, uh... okay, so this video I will come back to later is not playing. Uh, if you can see here, this girl, she is walking. Okay, you just give me a minute. Okay, I'm just going to come back to these videos in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to come back to these videos in a second. I'm just going to play uh, the videos for you from, from the folder itself. There seems to be some technical difficulty. Okay, so if you see this girl walking here, 
she's walking with a very abnormal posture of the knees uh, the weight shift is not proper she's bending on one side more the hands are not swaying so there are a lot of gait deviations she's walking it's not that she can't walk she's walking without support but you can see there are a lot of gait deviations she's not able to lift her legs up so feet are scratching on the ground and they are crooked and now if you see the balance is also not uh, very good so there is a risk of fall if she uh, keeps walking like this but if you see her now in water when she walks she is able to lift her leg up and walk now she requires support because this is the first session she is not very comfortable uh, in the water environment uh, in the way she is walking so she is able to but she is able to lift her legs up now it is more difficult to uh, walk in this environment because all of the compensations that she was doing to walk on land she is not able to do it here so it may happen that your child is walking on land without support and you take them in water and they are not able to walk and you will feel oh my god uh, is does that mean aquatic therapy is not working for them is it harmful for them it's not the child uh, when they have learned a certain motor patterns over years uh, what happens is that they uh, they learn these motor patterns and then to erase those motor patterns and teach them new it takes time and when you're erasing these patterns they have nothing to you know they have nothing really uh, with which they can achieve that particular movement so they may lose those movements for temporary uh, basis but they will regain the movements in much better and efficient way if you continue the therapy now if you see here uh, he is not able to walk without support and he has uncontrolled scissoring that is crossing of both the legs now he was given an aquatic therapy session where we did some passive stretching we did some active exercises now can you see the expression on his face is so happy doing that he is just splashing the water and then he was made to walk uh, his hand posture has not changed a lot this was again in one session but if you see the scissoring pattern if you see the two legs uh, here they are not crossing over so he is able to move the legs independently both the legs are not moving together i'm just going to show you that video again if you see here it is difficult for him to uh, move the legs independently they are crossing over each other and whereas at the end if you see he is able to move in them slowly voluntarily he is there's a controlled movement where he can move the legs separately again here if you see his attention is all you know his whole focus is on walking when on land he was walking uh, without any trouble because he was used to that environment now here it is different you can also see how erect he is standing he is not uh, bending uh, forward while walking so uh, this is a patient who had ataxic uh, component if you see when she is walking she is bending on uh, one side and she is not shifting the weight properly if you see the foot position is also not proper the feet are again uh, a uh, uh, dropping on to the floor when she walks okay this video is getting stuck in between so i'm going to move on to the next video now uh, this is a patient who had an ataxic component so if you see he is not able to walk in the straight line and his balance if you see the way he is walking his balance is not very good uh, he his movements are uncontrolled he is walking very fast and if you see after the session he is able to control his movements he can walk slowly and uh, he is walking in the straight line he is not uh, going you know 
uh, hay while, while walking. Now, if you see here, it's taking a lot of effort for him and he, he really needs to focus uh, because again, this is immediately after the aquatic therapy session. So they have to reorient themselves to the new movement pattern, which is which is a difficulty for them. He's also able to lift his legs much better. And while he lifts the leg, he can control his body, uh, which was not possible before. Now, here is another patient who had balance problems or ataxic component. If you see here, he's locking his legs. He's not able to stand on one leg for a long time. He's losing his balance very often. I'm just going to go back to that video for you. So if you see here, he's losing his balance very often, but on immediately one session after aquatic therapy, he's able to stand on one leg for much longer time without anybody's support here. He's almost falling while standing on one leg. But immediately after one session, you can see there's so much of difference in the balance also. Now, uh, this is an example I've put here. This is not a patient of cerebral palsy. However, uh, if you see even some patients of cerebral palsy who have weak muscles, you will notice the same kind of benefit in water. Now that he's not able to perform sit to stand movement on land. But if you see here in water, he can do that movement much easily. Because there's a lot of muscle weakness. He's a patient of muscular dystrophy who has a degeneration of muscles. And because of that, he's not able to perform a particular movement. So the muscle weakness can also be uh, benefited in water because we can facilitate movements. Now, what effect does water have on breathing? So if you see here on land, when he's breathing, it is 1,700 ml. Whereas in water, when I'm just going to play that video for you again. On land, when he's breathing, he can take in uh, 1,700 ml of air. And in water, it is just below 1,200. So there's a difference of almost 500 ml of air. So when we go in water, that's the effect or the compressive effect water has on our body. So uh, there's also a case of uh, spastic cerebral palsy. Now you can see after the three sessions, um, OK, again, this video is getting stuck, so I'll come back to that later. So uh, after knowing what are the benefits that the children can have, so these are all the different symptoms that can be affected. Their tone can be modulated. So the spasticity, dystonia, the ataxic component, uh, that can be modulated in water. We can improve their balance. We can improve their cardiovascular endurance. We can improve their breathing pattern. We can improve their gait patterns, their muscle strength. So all of that can be uh, influenced greatly in water. Uh, it's definitely not water versus land. So it's not that land therapy, uh, it, the water therapy can replace uh, therapy on land. No, it is a uh, it is a um, it has to be done in conjunction with the land therapy. Uh, it is a complementary therapy. So the limitations that we face on land, we can overcome in water. But there are a lot of limitations that we face in water as well. So it has to go hand in hand. Now, simply put, water uh, aquatic therapy is taking advantage of these properties of water and harnessing that power of water into a therapeutic benefit. I'm going to, in very short, tell you what are the different techniques that are used. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, usually, the techniques that are used are water-specific therapy, Badraga's ring method, clinical Aichi, Batsu, and aquatic exercises. So you will see when you go to an aquatic therapist, an aquatic therapy session will usually consist of uh, a combination of uh, these different techniques. Um, water specific therapy, what it means is uh, it has different ro rotational movements. So it has mental adjustment, which is the first and foremost where we adapt the patient to the environment of water. Not everybody is comfortable in water right away. So that adjustment uh, is called mental adjustment. Uh, then we teach them how to uh, do the breathing properly uh, in water. Uh, then there are different rotations about around the different axis of the body. So if you see here on the screen, uh, and if you consider this is the human body, this is the head and this, these are the legs, then sagittal rotation is this. This kind of a movement. 
we teach that. Then there is a transverse rotation, which will be this kind of a movement. So basically uh, sitting to standing, lying down to sitting, that kind of a movement which we will teach. Uh, this is called as water specific therapy. We also teach longitudinal rotation, which will be this, just rotating around your own axis. If you're lying down on water, it means doing this. So basically rolling in bed, turning in bed from one side to the other, that would be a longitudinal rotation movement. Um, and then combined rotation when we have a combination of two. So instead of doing the pure movements, I am rotating and going in the sagittal plane as well. Or I'm going in the sagittal plane and then I'm going in the transverse rotation and then in the sagittal rotation. So when I com combine any two rotations, uh, it's called combined rotation control. So we teach uh, how to control these rotational movements in our body in water specific therapy. We also teach something called as mental inversion where we teach that uh, when you're immersed in water, uh, your body, as long as there is air in your lungs, you are going to come out and you're going to float. You can't drown in water if there is lung, uh, if there's air in your lungs. And this is something that all the patients need to experience and understand because otherwise they are very, they can get very scared of water. Uh, and eventually then we come to uh, turbulent gliding or just the swimming or floating uh, kind of movement. And uh, these, once we teach all these movements, we use these movements for uh, in different ways for strengthening, for balance training, and all the therapeutic goals that you just saw. Uh, Badruga's ring method, it is, uh, there is a, a specific technique called proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And uh, that, uh, uh, so the Badruga's ring method is based on, or the, it takes the principles of proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And uh, it is performed with uh, floats uh, in the water. Vatsu is another technique where uh, uh, it's a passive relaxation technique. And a person is uh, moving, uh, is allowing the patient to experience certain movements in water. If you saw the stretching that I was doing for the boy with cerebral palsy, I had used certain movements that I've used in Vatsu uh, to, do, to do that. So in conclusion, uh, water provides a greater degree of freedom to movement, uh, greater degree of freedom of movement to these children. Uh, the benefits, as you saw, there are plenty of benefits on different symptoms, on spasticity, on uh, dystonia, on ataxic tone as well, on their balance, on their muscle strength, on the posture, their movement patterns, the joint dysfunction, also their cognition their breathing, uh, their ability to control their oromotor muscles. So a lot of symptoms can be benefited. It is a less stressful therapy for both therapists and for the patient. Both of them enjoy the therapy and you see, you see smiley faces in the pool all the time. Um, of course, sometimes when you introduce children for the first time in water, they may be scared, but eventually they really enjoy uh, water. Uh, there are different conditions that can be treated. So today we have restricted ourselves to cerebral palsy, but water can be beneficial for a lot of other conditions as well. Uh, but we need more and more aquatic therapy uh, centers, especially in India, if you see, we have very limited uh, facilities where trained therapists are available. So I must, uh, focus, uh, I must insist on this or emphasize on this, that aquatic therapy is a very complex form of therapy. It requires a great understanding of what kind of effect water will have on the body and therefore it is best done when you have a trained professional giving that therapy to the child there are certain exercises that can be performed by parents as well so even at our center we teach the parents how to do these exercises at home uh, but at that so uh, if the parents are trained by the professional to do those particular activities in water is great but i would not recommend taking your children without any supervision uh, without any professional supervision to the water. Now, what is the evidence? There are a lot of uh, uh, articles published uh, on cerebral palsy uh, and how uh, water benefits in cerebral palsy. I'm not going to go into the technical and uh, research details of all of those at the moment, uh, but you all can uh, view those articles on, they're freely available on Google and PubMed. Uh, Finally, as I said, land-based therapy versus aquatic therapy is not a fight. It is a teamwork. So you have to work together uh, with land-based therapists or the physiotherapists, occupational therapists. And it is a team effort as it is a multidisciplinary team effort. 
we uh, we can discuss with the physiotherapist as to what are the components that are more challenging uh, to accomplish on land and see if we can uh, coordinate that and, and do those activities in water to complement the land-based therapy. Uh, the reason I'm insisting on this so much is because we, we get uh, this question quite often that if you're doing aquatic therapy, do we still need to go physiotherapy or uh, vice versa when physiotherapist rec recommends aquatic therapy to children, the parents often wonder, but we are doing physiotherapy, then do we still need to do aquatic therapy as well? So I hope I have been able to answer some of those questions. Uh, questions in your mind that why we need to do aquatic therapy in addition to what uh, uh, to the land-based therapy that you're already doing and what benefit water can give you uh, and of course you would also go ahead with this teamwork and give a multidisciplinary rehab for uh, your children so finally i put one video to just show how how happy children are in water and if you can see this child uh, he is very comfortable in water and he's, he's happy going underwater as well. You can see he just wants to play. He does not want to really follow the command. So this is the kind of response that you get to begin with. But this is the enthusiasm that carries forward all the while uh, in, in the sessions. And it's very enjoyable for the children. So I would like to say thank you for uh, being with me for so long and uh, listening to my whole presentation. Uh, a small, um, I have to just quickly share with you the setup that we have in Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute. So this is the pool that we have. We have a specialized lift for uh, children who are not able to uh, walk properly, who are not able to uh, climb up on the stairs and get inside the pool. So we have a special lift to introduce these children in water. And uh, of course, today I'm talking to you about all these benefits of water and uh, was able to share all the videos with you. It won't have been possible without my team. So I would like to thank my team as well uh, for being very supportive and uh, doing the wonderful work that uh, we are doing, contributing to that. And once again, thank you very much for uh, being with me for almost 40, 45 minutes. I hope I've been able to uh, answer your doubts, uh, answer the questions that you had in mind. If you have any more questions, um, I would be uh, happy to answer those. So you can type and send me your questions and I will be answering that now. Okay, I have stopped sharing. So um, I think we have got only one question so far, uh, uh, which basically they wanted to know if we can, uh, they can get the slides, uh, we could do that. I would request all of you to send in more questions, any doubts that you have about aquatic therapy, and uh, I would be answering that. Okay, so we have got one question over here uh, by Mari Muthu. Uh, and uh, so the question is, ma'am, how would you manage children with orthotic devices uh, underwater uh, while doing aquatic therapy? Is it necessary to wear those, uh, those assistive devices? Uh, now, it depends. Uh, there are different assistive devices that are used. As, of course, you use AFOs, you use knee supports. Uh, sometimes you also use the trunk supports, uh, the SPOs. And so not all the orthotic devices are required to be used in water. What we have to see is what is the uh, aim of that particular orthotic device. Now, uh, if you go to see the AFO, well, if they have a flail foot and if they have weak dorsiflexus, is that the only reason 
uh, you're giving the air force, then uh, you probably would need to continue that in water to an extent. Uh, if it's because of the spasticity and because of abnormal posturing, that is something you can easily manage in water without the KFO as well. Uh, so it depends upon the level of training the therapist has had, the kind of uh, experience the therapist has had. You don't always need to use orthotic devices in water. Sometimes you may need to. So there are different uh, criteria for when and how you choose orthotic devices in water. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able. To, I may not be able to explain to you all the criteria. It differs from patient to patient. Uh, but yes, uh, we uh, you know we keep doing workshops on aquatic therapy as well. Those who are interested, uh, you can do these workshops, and we can elaborate and explain, or we can show you uh, how to do it. We also have a fellowship of neuro rehabilitation, regenerative neuro rehabilitation in neuro uh, in neurogen brain and spine institute. So you all can join the fellowship. Uh, to really get the hands-on experience of the kind of therapy we do over here. Is there a possibility of uh, conducting aquatic therapy training in Kerala? Uh, it's a question by Binoy Matthew. Uh, thank you so much, Binoy. Uh, I appreciate uh, asking this question. Uh, well, at the moment, uh, there aren't any, but we can discuss about this after the talk. Uh, if you can, uh, I'm sure we'll have your email address. So I will I will contact you on that email address and discuss with you further. There's one more question. You told about the concept that aquatic therapy reduces joint compression over joints, but children with CP may need proprioceptive stimulation while bearing weights. Can you elaborate on this? Yes, of course. So, uh, although, so what you're asking is right, when the joint compressive forces are uh, not there, the proprioceptive inputs have also reduced. But the proprioceptive inputs, uh, kind of are compensated when you perform a movement. So what happens in water is, as I said, on uh, on land, when we do a movement, the proprioceptive benefit, uh, inputs are mainly from the joints. The muscles are also uh, contributing to proprioceptive in inputs, which are less on land. But in water, if you see the resistance is much more. And so if you want to increase the proprioceptive uh, inputs that you're giving to the child, you have to make them do activities or movements. It has to be a dynamic component. Uh, only then they will get those proprioceptive stimulation. Only in standing, what you're saying is correct. If they are uh, immersed in neck deep water, then the proprioceptive inputs will be reduced. But to enhance that or to increase that, we can give them movements. And the moment they start moving, the muscles are used and the proprioceptive input is, uh, you can again, increase that uh, one another component that to to consider in in this uh, in this uh, particular question is when there is a lot of joint compression on land if you see so if you if you imagine a child walking in the crouch gate uh, the joints are in a very uh, abnormal posture or not in their physiological position at all so in water we have to give them that option of being able to achieve the physiological position as much as they can. Also, if the joints are compressed a lot on inland, there can be a lot of pain, which can hinder the movement. So when we are in water and that joint compression is reduced, it can take care of the pain also. And proprioception, as I said, we can increase with giving them more movements. The faster we do the movements, the more will be the resistance. Also, the movements when we do uh, in a certain plane, they provide more resistance for, for the for the movement. So we have to uh, all the properties that I have explained, the shapes that I have explained to you, take into consideration all of that. We can attach certain devices in water to increase the resistance experienced by the leg. So there's something called as fins, which are like fish fins, uh, which you can put it on your hands, you can put it on your legs. And that will uh, give increase the resistance and therefore increase the proprioception of uh, received by the patient as well. Uh, 
okay so i've i've received just a comment uh, that this was a very informative session thank you mari i appreciate uh, your feedback and i'm glad that i could be of help and uh, give all of this information to you all i guess we have uh, there are no more questions uh, i'm i'm happy uh, for all the questions you asked i am happy that you all were so intently listening to this talk uh, and i could be of help uh, keep uh, tuned in to neurogenbsi.com we have many more webinars uh, coming up in the following months uh, we will keep updating about that on the website and i hope we can help you like this in future as well thank you very much